Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Latest Shining Podcast. And this is actually our first joint podcast. I'm excited that we're doing this jointly with the CTO Advisor Podcast. And we have the CTO Advisor himself, Keith. Uh, Keith, how are you doing today? Pretty good. I can't complain. It's, uh, we're recording Thanksgiving week, so I'm, uh, I'm very thankful. Well, that's great. I did our big uh, grocery shop yesterday, except my wife didn't tell me that I was getting the turkey and everything. And it's not a good thing to go pick up a turkey when you have no clue what to buy. No, so, that's, uh, that's that good. That we're doing our big shop tonight, so hopefully uh, we don't get a frozen t- turkey. Yeah, so Rob, uh, are you guys doing the big turkey thing, or do you do the Austin organic who knows what kind of uh, thing. <laughs> that is our normal MO. You, you, you have pegged me as a farmer's market enthusiast, uh, uh-huh. you, know, you know, marinate with kombucha and you know, all the, all the, that, that's not actually a recipe. Don't, don't do it at home. Um, <laughs> but this time I, I'm traveling to the home turf, uh, to, to partake in some family, family reunion in, uh, Baltimore. I'm, uh, down the ocean. Uh, oh, well, uh, that's, and so I assume seafood becomes part of Thanksgiving. You're on the ocean then. You got to get those crabs. Yep, that's right. It's not I quite would, seasoned. But. I would assume so. Well, Keith and Rob, you know, there's a couple topics we want to go on. And as usual, we always talk edge. Uh, so let's start with edge. And um, Keith, why don't you kind of give us your thoughts on, um, you know, what edge is? I know that's still an open issue and where you see things now and maybe where you think see things going. Well, you know what? My definition may have to morph uh, at some point. It, at one point, it was simply anything that you can't put in the cloud. And it's not my definition. I love it. So done. (laughs) The edge, and but I think that's going to change quickly. But basically, the compute and storage that you can't uh, centralize in the data center or the cloud. I, Keith, I think that that's the best operative definition. I've been in too many conversations where somebody wants to talk through. It has to have this many milliseconds of latency and has to be under this many CPUs. And it, I, I think that's nonsense. I like your definition. Yeah, because there's so many other reasons for why you can't do that. And it's not just technical. There's politics. There's regulatory. There's a bunch of other reasons. So it's hard to put a technical definition around edge. I've, I've, I've got a, a, an a I'm interested in your opinion on this. So the, the thing that I see is if we can get edge working, right, which is hands off, right? And one thing I do think about edge is it's hands off. It, you have to design edge infrastructure so that there's no crash cart available, right? You're, you're, it's always a truck roll or you're sending in somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, um, right? You know, a, you know, a private in, in the, <laughs> on, on the battlefield trying to put in a USB drive. Um, it's most extreme case maybe, but if we get this right, I think it totally transforms enterprise data center. So the idea of a traditional enterprise IT data center is gone. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think you can, at least for the workloads that you can do that with like the modern workloads that it's not HPUX or AIX or some legacy, uh, component, but if you think about what AWS's dream is with uh, Snowball Edge, you know you I've I made the argument that Snowball Edge on paper is a HCI solution. It's a hyperconverged infrastructure that is pretty much as simple as possible. You 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 deploy three of them. Uh, one breaks or one uh, needs to in, be used to ingest data into AWS. You send out a new one, plop in a new one, expand the, the literally do nothing to expand the cluster. When the green lights start to flash, you take it. You, you take the one that needs to be shipped out back, and and it's done. There's no intelligence with that. That's that's Amazon's regular logistics. I can't wait to see what and and this this podcast will air after re. Invent. And we're doing it before, so I'm sure they're gonna they're gonna shake some ground um, with some announcements during reInvent on on extending the snowball um, that sort of small unit uh, lambda device uh, quite a bit because they already have green grass uh, going as a as a thing for this and Azure too. Microsoft has got their own sort of edge edge. Yeah, unit. they have their Azure stack, and but Azure stack is way more complicated than 
Snowball Edges, Azure Stack requires support from Dell, EMC, Fujitsu, HP, and all those guys. Whereas the Snowball Edge is all AWS, and there's and you know how AWS likes to do it. So I'm I'm pretty excited to look back on when we're listening to this podcast after reinvent to see if we were you know on the right track when it comes to the there should be some interesting announcements post reinvent. And and so. I mean, the, the, the Snowball Edge is a pretty limited use case. I mean, it, it's designed around Am, uh, Amazon services. Do you, do you see people trying to take more general purpose uh, infrastructure or application stacks like a Kubernetes containerized infrastructure and move that into an Edge workload? So I don't, that, that, I think that is pretty much the Nirvana. Basically, at some point, I need to be able to run complex workloads out by the edge. Uh, I don't I don't see a, a way ar- around it. The right. A16Z guys have said that the edge is going to kill the cloud. I don't think anything is going to k- kill the cloud. The cloud is going to continue to do. Amazon isn't going to take this 10 billion dollar business and just give up on it. <laughs> that I don't uh, Whoa, you know. Wait, so so A16Z Anderson it's one of the the most famous VCs around there. They've made a lot of really smart bets. Uh, Michael Dell said uh, Edge is going to be, or Edge is a hundred times larger than the internet, not just cloud. Uh, Gartner's predicting uh, forty times growth uh, in some of the some of the reports I've dug into. Um, yeah, uh, this is the next frontier for Amazon, Google, for Microsoft, for everybody. Yeah, I've made some wild predictions. I've predicted that Amazon is going to buy a legacy IT vendor, not because of the technology, but because of the support. Uh, logistics of you you can't you you need those complex workloads you you need to get it as simple as possible for the you know the AWS driver to pop in plop out one plop in a new one but from just a logistics of having hardware and everything staged for enterprise IT support I think at some point, AWS may look at this thing and say, you know what, before it gets away from us, we, we may need to buy a, a, a HPE, a IBM, or even a Unisys. That's, you know, I, 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 I can't, it might, we might be a couple of years out from that prediction, but I don't see AWS being able to grow this on their own. It, it's a very different model than what they're used to, because I, I do think, you know, you hit the nail on the head. It's an enterprise model. People aren't writing... Um, uh, <laughs> Amazon dot applications necessarily to the edge right now. Um, it's this is really for enterprise applications, you know, IoT, industrial, uh, retail, retail models. Do you? I mean, and they're huge. Those are huge applications. You, yeah. And- do you see this as an enterprise, you know, a, a multi-tenant. And actually, this is it is Edge the the next multi-tenant shared infrastructure uh, frontier. Oh, you're asking a uh, kind of my dream, my dream <laughs> environment. So on paper, with abundant network connectivity, with something like a network virtualization tool, whether it's NSX, Illumina, or anything that allows you to do multi-tenancy uh, micro segmentation, there's no reason why we couldn't take a uh, a, a multi-tenant approach to the edge. If I have, you know, at one point, uh, 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 120 CPUs out at an edge, and I'm only using 10% of that most of the time, that those spare cycles are, are, are just primed to be used somehow. And the best way to use that is, you know, over a, a multi-tenant uh, cloud control plane uh, with solid network controls that allow me to virtually carve out my network wherever it's at. And then the only other problem that I have is kind of data and getting the data that I need out to that edge. Right. That makes a lot of sense. We, we had a, uh, another podcast with Bernard Golden about, about edge um, when he was, he was predicting the death of the death of cloud or the near death of cloud. Um, but one he of the things a, that, that we described, uh, I'm sorry? sorry, I was just going to say, he had a tombstone on his blog <laughs> that said cloud computing and killed it this year. 
So, uh, <laughs> it was, he, he didn't year. just he predict it for 2018. He's already got him carved in advance. It's already carved in stone and dead. So uh, it's more than just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's one of those things. It, it's cloud too big right now to actually say that we're going to kill it. I mean, it is between just between Microsoft and Azure by themselves. The workloads that you have on there are kind of like mainframe. Like you're not, they're not going to go away. They're they're totally not. The the thing that Bernard and I were talking about was uh, um, that you don't. Right now, we're deploying specialized infrastructure for every application out there. And so you're starting to get redundant hardware and, and companies that don't want to be in the infrastructure and the real estate business, because uh, I consider data centers a real estate business. Uh, the companies don't want to, they want to do their apps. They don't want to worry about, you know, geolocation of, you know, cell towers and putting, you know, putting infrastructure out in the field you know, in farms and cities and things like that and retail establishments and malls, they want to say, I, I want, I just need a little piece of that. And can I please share that tenancy with somebody else? I mean, there's clearly a cloud-like market for this edge infrastructure. That's where, that's where Bernard and I ended up going. Yeah, well, let's look at other infrastructures. So okay. every, you know, we can look through, we love to pick on electricity as the prime example there are still people who generate their own electricity when, you know, it makes sense at scale, but for the wide majority of the market, even when there's when, even when there came a nascent market that generating your own electricity from uh, whether it's uh, your own windmill on top of your building or uh, solar, yeah. the, industry came in and started providing solutions. So now more, if you're in the U S there's a likelihood that you can go straight to your utility provider or one of their close partners, get your own on-premises uh, solar generation plant and feed back to the grid. So there's this, if we continue to use electricity as the model, edge computing should follow that, that, that use case or that model and say that, okay, we centralized it. We've discovered that centralizing it has economies of scale that, that are undeniable. But there's these edge use cases. Sorry for the pun. There's these edge use cases in which you need your own uh, compute and your own infrastructure. But why, why do I want to manage it? Why do I want to deploy it? Why do, why do I, I don't, I don't want to be in the business of generating electricity. I just want to watch football. Oh, but I, I think this analogy is great. And, and I, I think it's, it's troublesome though, because what we're finding is that we don't, you know, especially with solar, uh, we, we are creating a highly distributed generation, right? Capacity model where a, a, a company could actually generate most of their own, you know, supply most of their own load off their own infrastructure. The interesting thing is they might not own those panels. They might be leasing them. They might be managed by a third party who's not the power company or in partnership with the power company. Um, and I think the edge compute models that we're designing are going to look very similar, right? Somebody who has a base load need is going to be able to say, wow, if, if I can actually create portability, that's the key word then what keeps me from having my own infrastructure to handle a percentage of my base and then rely on you know, centralized infrastructure, cloud infrastructure uh, for base load or for specialized need or for that, you know, sort of that, that, that bursty stuff I don't want to accommodate. Um, yeah. The, you, so this is, this actually happened last week is AWS announced that they're selling their physical access assets in China to a Chinese company. So they won't even own their own cloud infrastructure. They're owning the services that sit on top of that infrastructure, but a third party is going to manage, control, and maintain Amazon's physical plant. So we are at the point where even the cloud is abstracting away the physical, the, you know, that physical bits of it and the, tr the true value add, the cloud control plane and services that run on top of that compute is managed by where it adds value. So I'm pretty sure to Amazon, 
you know, owning a, a you know, 30,000 uh, Intel CPU, CPUs has no intrinsic value to them. It's the services that they provide on top of that infrastructure. So I, I think we're already there where we're, we're going to see these models where Azure Stack, uh, AWS, uh, Snowball Edge, and all these services are managed by third parties. And our intelligent applications are just going to sit on top of that. I, I think you're right, but there's, there's a couple of things I want to dig into with this. So one of them is, do you think it's going to be a credit card transaction business the way Amazon has it, right? Are these edges going to be anybody shows up at the edge and can drop a workload anywhere they want? It, it, it feels to me like it's going to be much more of a walled garden. At, <laughs> Yeah, I think I think we've I think the ship has passed on standards and 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 cloud computing. We're uh, going to have exactly what we have in electricity today, which is <laughs> if I'm in the U.S., my uh, 220 plug will work fine. When I go to Europe, I'm going to have to carry a bag of adapters to 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 get it to work the way that I want it to work. I had a friend from New Zealand come over and she took a picture of the wall outlet here in the US and she said, what are these scary things? So I think uh, the edge is, you know what, that, 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 that boat has sailed. We're not gonna get a standard across I, the edge. I agree. I agree with you. I was actually thinking of a different type of wall garden. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. so much for that analogy, darn it. Uh, I, it's, I don't think it's as open commercially to I run, right? Because right now in Amazon, you don't know who your neighbors are. You don't care. Or, well, some people do. But, but for the most part, anybody can show up and run on a server. I, I feel like the edge infrastructure that gets deployed in cell towers is not going to be anybody shows up. I think it's going to be very carefully policed by a gatekeeper to say these workloads are allowed to run on this set on this infrastructure because I have a deep commercial relationship with them. Um, and everybody else, you know, go away. I, this is, this is limited. Um, it's not limited use gear, but it's, it's limited commercial availability to that like like cell towers are today right you can't just show up and put your antennas on a cell tower yeah so you think i think natural commercial agreements are just going to form and the barrier to entry will be you know just one thing will just be price the, putting a server inside of a cell tower is advantageous to a select few companies so netflix obviously has a vested interest in getting their gear inside of a cell tower. Uh, however, uh, if I'm a futures trader and I, or if I'm a financial services company, that has no advantage to me. So there, there will be some, you know, marketplace at some point that says, oh, how do I position my workloads at the edge? And I guess that's the question. Are, there's gonna be natural fits what's the mechanism from a marketplace perspective that a AT&T can serve its customers saying, hey, you have workloads that need to be in this type of edge, the cell tower, versus these types of workloads that need to be closely uh, held close to the New York Stock Exchange. Both might cost the same, but the attributes of that edge matters depending on the application. And, and I think that the market's going to be much more differentiated from a cost perspective, because you're right, the, the, the latency between the New York Stock Exchange, we already know is a premium item versus, you know, uh, latency to fields in Nebraska for a different company might be a premium, but different, you know, but not as not as much demand. Right. Um, and or so, capacity. Or, or capac and, and capacity might be more limited. It strikes me that, that, that what we're describing, this shared tenant infrastructure, is highly valuable and will have a premium compared to uh, AWS workloads, which means that people will continue to use cloud as much as they possibly can to, to do as much compute as they can and then only pull things back into those shared, shared edge infrastructures where it's, it's a value. So, Rob, I got a question for you. The, yeah. You know, we started out the conversation defining what is the edge, which we said anything that can't run in the cloud, 
But now we've just defined the edge as this highly distributed cloud that in, <laughs> in theory, you know, we have this marketplace that front ends it that allows you to put your, you know, now it becomes yet again, another AWS service. And I just need to decide and and what data center I wanted to run in. Do I want it to run in North Virginia, uh, uh, region one, or do I want it to run in North Virginia, region one, sub region, something else that puts it right next to the department of DOD, right next to the Pentagon. So that I have high, low latency uh, access to uh, other workloads running in the Pentagon. So, you know, what is the edge? I, so what, what you're describing, I, it's a good question. I, I think that the definition that I've been moving towards has to do more with the patterns of use and the way people approach it. Um, because I don't think we're, I think we're a ways off um, from having applications that automatically are portable enough to sort of move, you know, automatically move themselves into low latency environments. So, right, I, I don't expect that uh, there's some magic that's going to occur. And I, uh, I was just talking to a company called mutable.io mutable that, that actually is building some magic. So maybe they'll prove me completely wrong. Um, move magically move applications from centralized cloud infrastructure into low latency um, locations in a completely automated way with a single fabric, um, which is what you just described to me. It's like, Oh, I can, here's, I need to be in West. I need to be in Virginia. Here's some containers put them wherever it's smartest to put them. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I, think, I, I, don't I, I think today we're pretty safe with our, our, our definition, but if our dream yeah, of, of having a distributed edge that is cloud aware or a cloud that is edge aware, depending on how you look at it is uh, that, that will, then I, get, I guess it's, it's all just cloud at that point. So, Here's, here's one of the places where I, I distinguish it. And we, we talked a little bit but before we started recording about this. When we talk about, about edge, we're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of individual sites. Um, it's, so it's a completely different management paradigm, right? I'm trying to run my application, parts of it in, in very consistent, very distributed ways. And the cloud pieces, by comparison, looks like a monolith. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think we've got all the management thought through. I mean, you, you do a lot of DevOps work. What do people think about when they're building an application? You know, even in the yeah. Nirvana we're talking about, where you can just go and say, "Oh, I want to run this in, you know, a thousand cell towers or ten thousand cell towers." Build yeah, you run into the same problem. Whereas, you know, cell, and we can. Real world scenario is AT and T and Verizon, Vodafone. All of these huge cell phone providers have to limit the number of services that they run at the cell tower. So they can't just partner with any old um, content provider and say, "Hey, we'll put any application in any cell t in, in any one of our cell towers." And now we have you know eighteen different partners. That actually, that number might be too low. We have a thousand different partners, each with eighteen different solutions that we have to support, and that right. ends up being DevOps in a nutshell, or specifically micro segmentation in a. I mean, microservices in a nutshell. In theory, I can build, and I use this example. In theory, I can build Adobe Premiere, the desktop application using nothing but microservices and uh but when something breaks it will be impo nearly impossible to troubleshoot and that's the problem that teams are having in determining how to break up their applications into microservices how granular do you go with microservices or do you even adopt a pure microservices uh, architecture for the entire application. In some cases, it, it has no value and makes no sense to do so. So you don't, otherwise you create, you know, this whole management nightmare on the other end of it. Well, and then, and then in the microservices, now you've gotten communications. And so 
you might have broken up things and then split them in, in a way that creates latency problems for the whole application. Yeah, you have this whole message bus, bus problem that they, that, you know, the, <laughs> and as you think of, uh, across clouds, and we talked about, you know, this whole mark, cloud market piece, am I going to have the same message bus available to me that I have in AWS for workloads running in Azure because Azure has the, the edge sites that I need to, 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 to run a properly dispute, distributed application. So there's a lot of things that we, we can't even predict that. Yeah, we can't even predict the, the, a lot of the challenges that we'll have because we just, you know, it's, the scale I think is not, we don't know what the scale will look like for, the, for a centrally managed edge. I, and this, I don't, a centrally managed edge is, is almost an oxymoron, right? It's, you, you're going to have to have a, a CI pipeline. You're going to have to have A/B tests, and you're going to have to distribute changes to sites gradually. Um, but the, yeah. the management of it's totally foreign from you know this, an A/B test for an application on a, thou, on a thousand servers in a single data center. It makes is is already a challenge, right? But that's yeah. child's play compared to uh, you know a ten thousand node you know uh, retail data set infrastructure that you have to manage in a globally distributed way with limited bandwidth to do it. Yeah. You know, on, on, and I think it's hard to, it's hard to convey the complexity of this or one over audio and two on a, on a short podcast. And this is, this podcast will be a little long for a CTO advisor podcast, but the conceptually is simple. Oh, there's a bunch of compute nodes they register with a control plane and the control plane keeps it, uh, keeps everything in sync. What's, what's the big deal? <laughs> and there is so much that can go wrong. You know, we are abstracting away. There's, you know, here, here's a simple problem. The, well, here's a simple example of a problem that we have real world in data center. If you have a data center with more than 300 machines, how does patch management go for you in that single data center? Right. Now, think about patch management for a tightly knit application across 10,000 nodes. You might have this problem today, but you're not operating that, the, you're not operating those 10,000 nodes as a single data center. You're, you, they're, you know, a bunch of micro sites and you're treating each problem at a micro level but if you if you want an application that can run anywhere within your 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 network and cluster of, of applications, keeping everything in sync is 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 tough. Right. Well, th this is where with digital rebar we've we've been doing some some really deep thinking about how you make sites that you can manage by remote, so you're not in a control your control plane is not spread across the globe in a in a tightly coupled way. Um, but it's a super hard problem, right? You have to be able to make incremental changes. You have to think about immutability because configuration management systems really break down uh, if there's drift and, and if there's not high, if there's low latency. Um, and, then, and then since you truck roll, you can't crash cart to it. You have to truck, you know, I, I'm, my assumption is it's, 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 you know, you're rolling a truck or you're getting FCC permission to enter a restricted space. Um, there's no easy way to say, oh, okay, well, I, if there's a bug or a defect, I, I'm just going to go fix it. Now, all of a sudden, you've got, you know, tens of thousands of, of bugs that you have to go fix in the field. Um, the classic story is, you know, it's a company that makes uh, IoT locks, and they pushed a patch that, that uh, wrecked all the locks. Yeah. And people couldn't get into their houses. <laughs> um, so those are real problems. You know, look no further than the S3 outage that happened a few months ago. Whenever something, whenever a outage happens at a Netflix or Amazon, I look very closely, closely at those things and ask myself the very serious question. Can, could I have done it any better than AWS or Netflix? They are in the business of making sure this stuff works. And to assume that I have the skill, whether in-house or via my partners, to make something very similar work as seamless, 
you, you know, I, unless my pride is, is just too strong, I have to go back and say, you know what, this stuff is hard. I, I will agree that it's hard. I, I, don't, I, I don't think that um, in some of these use cases that Amazon, what Amazon has built automatically, tra their expertise is going to automatically translate. Um, in some cases, I think that, you know, what, I think, there, I think there's some greenfield opportunities in edge infrastructure management where it's a much more limited environment where there's different, different things than what Amazon's already built. I, I don't discount the, the quality of their people and their innovation and their ability and their budgets. Um, but I don't think that the way Amazon manages their data centers, which are highly prescriptive and homogeneous. Um, and at this point, you know, with 10 years of legacy in them have, can just automatically be applied to these other environments because I think they're different. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. So I don't, I don't, I, I want to make sure I, what I do is I use it as an asset test to say, you know what, this is a hard problem. You, actually, <laughs> actually, let me go the other way. A lot of times, a lot of times I'll look at something and say, okay, why can't we just abstract that away and, and just, and use a as a service interface to to use that service a great example is sap so sap from a application perspective makes perfect sense however when you go to take a sap a system built for sap srm or ecc and apply it to your manufacturing processes specifically you're going to find where it breaks, where the logic yeah. breaks. So AWS is no different. You can't take AWS and take some batch process that runs in your mainframe and say that you can automatically, you know, that whole mainframe deal of dead last year at AWS reInvent had me dying laughing. Like, no, I, I can't just <laughs> magically take my batch processes, run it in AWS and kill my mainframe. What I do look at is saying, okay, here's a similar problem. And to think that I can solve, I can easily just, and we, I had this problem when I worked for a uh, IT services company, largest IT services company to the federal government. And we were going to quote unquote, build a cloud. And I saw the uh, R and D budget. And it was something like, I'm making up a number $1.5 million. And I said, you know what? I, I want nothing to do with that project. <laughs> nowhere, nowhere near enough resources to solve that problem. So that's what I mean by scale and saying, okay, are we really approaching this problem seriously? Right. Right. No, I, I think that Amazon has redefined, uh, and I, I think they get, I think they get the credit for doing this. Other, other cloud companies are doing a good job, but they've really redefined the, the what scale IT infrastructure automation look, looks like, both by internal practice and what they have, the market they've built around their infrastructure as a service market. Um, they've redefined what, what scale looks like, what automation looks like. Well, you know, it's a, it's a fit in, it's a fit and finish thing. Hmm. There's a, there's a HCI company. They'll remain nameless that says that their, their, their solution is like public cloud. And I keep scratching my head. I'm like, okay, I understand that you guys are marketers. But when, you, when you're talking to me, you have to, when I use AWS, I don't think about the infrastructure at all. Like the physical layers of the infrastructure, I don't think about like how are the locks working, how are the biometric locks working on when people enter the, the system. I just go to the interface. I design my infrastructure and I deploy it virtually. That is the fit and finish I'm looking for when you say, okay, it's like public cloud. When, if I still have to think through how many, uh, my power, rack configuration, blah, blah, uh, network stack, that's not, I'm sorry, it's, it's, that's not like public cloud. That's simpler infrastructure, but it's not public cloud. And, and this is our dilemma, I think, on the edge, is that the edge is going to be in a place where you still have to worry about the resource constraints and a lot of those aspects for a while. And yet, 
the people writing applications are showing up with the assumption that it's going to be like public cloud. That that ship's already sailed. Yeah, that that you're you're absolutely correct in that. And and then there's just other challenges that we haven't even talked about at the edge. The control plane today for cloud is too big for the edge. You know, you look at Azure Stack. Azure Stack has four nodes because I think a quarter of those four nodes are dedicated to the control plane for the cloud. So I can't use one fourth of my minimal configuration for a control plane in a lot of use cases. So today the control plane to even provide that is, is too big. Totally agree. I, I've been making a comment about OpenStack for this uh, same thing, saying OpenStack is it's just too big from that perspective to to be a good a good fit for the edge. There's too much complexity because it's not designed for that. No, right? It's and and this is this is my point with the limited user base. Some of the cloud use cases assume that random people show up with. Tenant needing tenant isolation and complex networking topologies and things like that. I think when we when we see real this first generation of edge applications, actually I would say second because there already are edge applications. The second generation of edge applications are really going to have to be designed to fit within what's available for edge. Um, and then the caveat is, but they're going to be run on the cloud first, and then and then pulled back to the edge or distributed out to the edge. Um, so there's going to be this interesting hybrid, and and I probably just made a whole bunch of people just like shake by saying the word hybrid. But this is <laughs> this is hybrid, right? We're going to have things that that run in the cloud, they're built in the cloud, they're designed for the cloud, and then sort of dropped down into the edge, because um, that's how we design things. Just well, you know, we we haven't gotten to the topic that we talked before uh, we started recording, which is. Compute now has, while we're having this conversation, compute now has gravity. And oh, we, we, brought this up. Yeah, yeah, we we never want to admit to this. You know, Dave, we, Dave McCrory. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're, we're calling you out here. And this is not a call out. This is, when he Dave made the statement, on. it was absolutely true that it was easier to move the compute to data than to move the data to the compute. Right, data gravity. Yeah, and when you look at things like TensorFlow and what Google is doing with ML and AI, and they are differentiating things, I can no longer say, oh, I'll simply do that in my data center where the, where the storage is at. No, I, 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 quite frankly, I can't. The stuff moves so fast. By the time I, with my operating model inside of a data center, deploy it, what I deploy is going to be stale and not nearly as fast as what Google is deploying in their cloud. So I have to figure out a way to move my data to that point. And a lot of edge use cases, we simply can't move the compute away from the edge. The data has to be there. And trying to figure that out, I think, is probably the... I'm doing a pod, uh, webinar on it, and I'm surprised, you know, it's just little old me, and I have, you know, close to 40 registrations after a week and a half. It's a super popular topic of, it, it's a legit challenge. The research is being done at the edge and trying to, you know, find ways to get that, that, that proprietary compute, because it's proprietary to an extent, back into our data center in, in a usable fashion for the end user that competes with the cloud. It's a tough challenge. Yeah, it really is. And I, I think that um, channeling Dave and, and Stephen, you and I have to have to get Dave uh, on a on a podcast to refute. Yeah, I'll refute. go after him. I, I, he's, Dave, Dave and I co-founded a company way back before the dawn of time. And so I'll, I'll talk to him next week. Um, but <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the idea here, I think Dave would, Dave would channel us and say, you know, that's still data gravity. The reason we're having this conversation about compute gravity is because the data is at the edge and it, the, the work has to be done at the edge and that's where it's collecting. Um, and then a lot of these use cases say, all right, only send out a, a small amount of the data to collect in, into a deeper pool. Um, so so I, Dave, and I know Dave actually has mathematical formulas for all this stuff. That's why I want to I want to bring him, bring him on and, and, and totally geek down on, on the math, but. Um, I'm not attending that if it's going to be that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I, uh, I got to differential equations and they looked at me and I said, what am I doing here? So. We'll do it, we'll do it with, with animal puppets um, <laughs> and some references, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, Keith, this is, this is ex I think you're, you're, you're hitting on something that's really important, right? We're, we're in a world where there's a lot of activity being done. There's some really deep processing that we're starting to make happen. Um, and there's a huge amount of, of ingest data to make that decision. And then you don't need, you don't need it after you've, you've sort of done, after you've analyzed the picture for facial recognition, all you need is the face map um, at that point. And, you know, that's what you send forward. You don't necessarily need to send um, the whole video stream back. And, and, what, and you, what I think it goes back to our earlier part of our conversation, which is how do you provide cons a, a consistent compute experience at the edge, so that those applications can even be written. Right. And this is where we're going to have a lot of fun over the next couple of years talking through what those applications look like, how we distribute them, how we manage them at scale, how we build the infrastructure in a manageable way so it, it creates a, a, a shared, shared platform. Boy, I don't feel like we've answered any questions. All we've done is open, open up Pandora's box of... of cool. Well, I'm a I'm a consult I'm a consultant. My my job isn't to answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now you so let, let's use that as an outro if you want. Stephen, do you want to wrap, help wrap us up and let yeah, I mean, pitch yeah, of services? That, that was fantastic. Why don't you tell us a little about where um, maybe the services you offer, and if people are interested in getting a hold of you, we'll let you run a little commercial here. Happy to do it. All right. So uh, obviously you can find me on Twitter at CTO Visor on LinkedIn. Uh, it, it, the services are basically strategy services. It, if you, if you want help thinking this through workshops, I'm not staff or st strategic. If you're looking for workshops, sitting your people down, thinking through this and creating a roadmap for your enterprise architecture. It's what I do. Reach out to me via any one of those mediums, LinkedIn, Twitter, email, I'll, I have no problems giving it out, Keith at the CTOadvisor.com. That's the website as well. And, and, and I can on Twitter you, like I do. It's awesome. And, <laughs> and from personal, I watch all his videos on LinkedIn. I, I like them. I think they're really useful. And uh, he's the hardest working man based on all these videos. So I won't tell you the secret. <laughs> being he's got smart, three, he has three twin brothers that no one knows about <laughs> there you go not twins or quadruple brothers but uh keith thanks again for uh, joining us today and this is really interesting this is our first joint podcast with another podcast rob we keep having you first and uh don't seem to stop and uh certainly i think definitely in a couple months keith bring you back and uh rehash this where are we now where did we think we were going to go um and it's valuable to get your insight as well. I'd like to talk about in the future about what your customers are seeing, what they're worrying about. I mean, I think there's, we have enough material to just stay with you full time, but <laughs> definitely that. Well, thanks we to both to, of you guys need, for- We need to work on our edge bingo boards for the uh, Jaffe keynote at uh, Invent. <laughs> edge bingo boards. Well, thanks again. And uh, have a, uh, for those of you listening, who hear this live, uh, you'll realize that we've already eaten Thanksgiving, but Rob and Keith have a uh, good Thanksgiving here in the States uh, this week. Thanks, Thanks a lot. You too. Thanks.